But I think the game itself changed uh, more or less to another game, if we can say, in the last uh, two decades. Yeah, just, you know, echoing what Judith just said, so I, I'm just smiling because it's, I um, remember so the way I've been preparing in the 70s. Tonight, we will look at how technology has transformed competition by studying the specific case of the game of chess. To do this, we've put together a most extraordinary panel. Our panel includes Gary Kasparov, Judith Polgar, and Frederick Friedel. I'd like to give a brief introduction to the first of our two panelists without giving too much away. Judith Polgar is a Hungarian chess grandmaster and is widely considered to be the greatest female chess player of all time. She's the only female chess player to achieve a top 10 ranking and was top, the top rated female player from 1989 all the way to 2015. Her contributions to the advancement of women in sport cannot be overstated as her accomplishments have been called one of the greatest female achievements in the 20th century. Gary Kasparov is a Russian chess grandmaster, former world champion, and is considered by many to be the greatest chess player of all time. From 1986 until his retirement in 2005, he held the number one ranking in the world for all but three months. He's well known for his affinity for computer chess, most notably his pioneering use of computers for chess preparation, and his match with the IBM supercomputer Deep Blue. Judith and Gary, welcome. Hi. Tonight, I'd like to dig into how technology has transformed competition. First, Judith and Gary, I was hoping you'd both be willing to share some details regarding your education and experiences in chess from an early age. How did you become interested in chess? And could you talk about each of your journeys to becoming a professional chess player? Well, uh, if I may start, uh, I grew up in a very special family. And by the time I started to play chess when I was five, uh, I had both of my older sisters playing already. So it was kind of uh, very natural for me to follow on my sister's activities. Susan, who is seven years older than I am, she was already competing quite well internationally. And uh, for me, it was very, very natural from day to day uh, to live in this chess atmosphere, the apartment house. Also, I didn't go to school as my other two sisters uh, were also homeschooled. So it was a very unique and special atmosphere we grew up, and chess was in the focus of the family. I was born in a very ordinary family, so no siblings. And um, according to our urban legends, I was watching my uh, mother and father trying to solve a chess problem from a newspaper. And I got really interested, excited about this uh, magic game. And it was match made in heaven. So from that very moment that happened, I don't know, maybe in, in winter of 1968 to 1969, so I was five and a half probably, I uh, got so fascinated with the game of chess and I'm still very much in love with the game. And um, uh, I uh, learned very quickly. And uh, though my father died when I was seven, so he already made a decision to send me not to a not, not musical school, as was a tradition for the Jewish side of my family, but to, to a chess club. And since seven, I was a regular student in the Pioneer Palace in Baku. And um, it went very quickly. So jumping from uh, one category to another, and by age 10, I was already one of the top junior player in uh, um, my uh, native republic of Azerbaijan, where I was born and raised in the city of Baku. And in your sort of process from sort of young boys and girls who, who truly fell in love with the game of chess. What were your experiences like becoming professional chess players? Both of you, in some sense, were outsiders in sort of the, the field of chess. I mean, when Judith sort of became a very strong chess player, it was not typical for women to play chess at a very high level. And Gary, for you, when you were becoming a very strong chess player, Gary, you had hopes of becoming world champion, but Karpov at the time was world champion. And there was a sense that uh, people were content with, with this setup. What, do you have any comments about this? Well, uh, I grew up in a family where both of my parents uh, are teachers. So it was very clear that they, uh, they knew what they want to 
do with us how they want to develop us. And I learned the first few moves from my mother. Later on, I was playing chess with my father, which followed it with the teachers and coaches and then my sisters. But I remember I played the first uh, tournament around the block when I was about six. And uh, I was uh, winning the first international competition in New York, uh, the unrated section. That was a big story on New York Times as well. And uh, to tell you the truth, I think by the age of 10, 11, it was kind of clear that I'm going to be a professional chess player. There were no doubts about that as I was uh, developing and uh, increasing my level very fast. So it is kind of very strange for me thinking that uh, what it would be if I would do something else because it came so naturally for me. And uh, I grew up not only special, a very special way from point of view that I was homeschooled, but also as a girl, I was playing against adults most of the time and most of the time against men because my parents believed and raised me and my sisters the way that if you get the same uh, training and same opportunities as a boy, then you can reach the highest as well. And uh, I'm very thankful for this, that uh, I was growing up this way. And uh, I also try to pass it on on my daughter, that what are the expectations uh, for her in life. And uh, I think this means a lot in general from parents' point of view, that please don't limit girls what they can reach. I think it's uh, the most important thing is that they can reach the maximum they have and what they can uh, to, to reach. So for me, it was very obvious and uh, I was very much in love with the game since uh, very little and obviously also because I was very successful. So I've won many games, one game after another, which of course pushes you even more ahead. For me, the first turning point was in 1973. I was uh, selected uh, to play for um, Azerbaijan team at the um, uh, old Soviet Youth Games in, in the city of Vilnius. Uh, I was just 10 and it was not the greatest performance. So I, uh, I won two games, I lost three, I made uh, uh, um, four draws. Uh, but uh, uh, I was the youngest player in the tournament and I was noticed uh, by my future coach Alexander Nikitin who recommended me to be uh, admitted to a uh, legendary Botvinnik school. And in August 1973, I met Mikhail Botvinnik, and that was a really big deal. So it's hard to explain today. That's for me, it was just, you know, uh, a trip um, uh, to, to Wonderland. And uh, um, since 1973, so I, I got uh, um, Botvinnik's attention, and uh, uh, it was a great help. And it also... Um, uh, helped me back back in Baku to uh, get more coaching, and uh, by age 12 in 1976, I already won uh, all Soviet uh, Junior Championship under 18, which was quite a record. The next year, I repeated my success, doing it twice in a row. Um, and uh, uh, though um, the World Champion tit uh, Champions title was, you know, um, far away. Everybody knew that I could be the most natural contender to Anatoly Korpov. Uh, of course, it involved many other stories that uh, were played not at the chessboard, but around chessboard. But uh, my uh, way to the top uh, was um, quite, you know, st straightforward. Again, there were high expectations. And I, I also believe that um, uh, that's what I could do. Um, and... Um, it was very natural, natural progress, you know, from year to year. So climbing at this, at, at the at this chess uh, uh, stairs to the very top of of um, chess Olympus. Interesting. And uh, for our viewers who aren't necessarily up to speed on chess, I would say that Balvinik was one of the sort of greatest chess players ever. And you could sort of relate it to a young chess player today, maybe getting the chance to learn and spend time with you, Gary, to put this into context. Yes, uh, and also it's it's the, um, but the next influence was not just on my chess game, but also on the way I viewed the game. And uh, I, ever since I believe that it was a responsibility of a top player to help uh, new generations. So uh, when I became world champion, I uh, uh, um, asked Botvinnik to restart our, our joint program now. And uh, so many great players came out of our 
of our effort uh, in 80, um, 86, 87. So including Vladimir Kramnik or Alexei Shirov and many others. It's, it's a very long, long list of, of grandmasters. Uh, and uh, uh, in early uh, uh, early 21st century, so I started uh, my um, uh, foundation here in the United States, and it's spread out around the world. And I feel, you know, that is it's some sort of my duty to help younger players to learn from me the same way I learned from Botvinnik and other great Soviet players. No, no, that's that's perfectly on point. And in fact, this sort of shifts towards our next topic: the concept of sort of preparing for chess competition. And how this has really changed over time. I mean, okay, I don't want to you know, speak for you, but I, I like to believe that more or less what you're saying is that early on in your career, Gary, there was sort of a lack of information. There were, you know, you sort of waited to get these periodicals that contained chess games, that contained analysis. Whereas these days, there are sort of these large databases that contain games. There are engines that give you sort of easy access to sort of analysis. How did the two of you prepare for chess competition sort of throughout your careers? And in many ways, how did this change over time? Well, for me, sport was, uh, of course, starting already very early in, in my age. And I, in the beginning, I took uh, chess as a game in the beginning, obviously. Then it was also sport, very fast. It was a competition. But also science and research was always uh, somewhat uh, very important uh, during my, uh, my years in competition. And it was interesting that the way I grew up with the, uh, the trainers, I was solving a lot of tactical uh, positions. I was developing my opening repertoire as well. But still, I was always focusing and most of my uh, play was very creative all the time. And this was, I was always very natural for me and I was kind of proud of it. I was always looking for creative, unusual ideas. And uh, opening theory was not very much my piece of bread. It was, uh, well, contrary to Gary, who was uh, the leader in the world in uh, creating uh, opening theory. But uh, so sport uh, aspect, of course, it was the main part of, of my life. But I always like to dig into the artistic part of the sport. And of course, later on, uh, we will touch the topic about the computers, how it involved the preparation and the mindset of a, of a, a player. Because uh, in the very beginning, when I started to play chess, you have to visualize it that I had the chess board front of me. Usually I had a partner sitting opposite uh, to me. Many times it was my sister or later on my older sister when I got better or we had trainers. And then uh, when we were analyzing some situations, whether it's opening or middle game or end game of the game and analyzing of big champions games, I remember following Gary's World Championship match with Karpov. It was uh, so special to, to watch it and follow it. All those thoughts, what we had, we were writing down on a piece of paper and we were waiting the new magazines and books to arrive and to learn from that. And of course, it shifted to a completely different world when we started to have the, the technology involved in, in chess. So I liked very much the creative part and, and when, when all the aspects uh, are really part of the game, the psychology, the preparation, home preparation, your mindset, your physical preparation, uh, the situation of the tournament, how do you handle a victory, how do you overcome on a bad situation, a bad game, a struggle, or how do you handle if you win the first few games and you're leading in a tournament, but you have to still hang on and, and, and keep these strengths and move forward. So the, the sport aspect of the game is, uh, is wonderful, but I think the game itself changed uh, more or less to another game, if we can say, in the last uh, two decades. Yeah, just, you know, echoing what Judith just said, so I, I'm just smiling because it's, I um, remember so the way I've been preparing in the 70s. Uh, now, information was available, though, some magazines, but, you know, it was very slow, of course. And uh, again, it's just it's the um, it's the, the volume of information was 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 so so you know, tiny compared to what what we can have today. You know, just uh, by just swiping uh, our, our finger, you know, um, on a screen. 
Um, and uh, you know uh, the way I prepared for uh, for some games and and, and uh, looked for some openings, I had to collect the games. I I was recording these games, you know. And I remember that uh, my uh, coach Alexander Nikitin sent me from Moscow a special set to print diagrams. I printed diagrams and then put pieces there. So it's all <laughs> handmade. So it's it sounds like you know it's a stone age. But that's the way we worked in in the seventies. I my mother still keeps you know the the uh, um, the notebooks you know the this with you know with uh, my handwriting. So this is collecting games of the top players, and those were you know some kind of tests to uh, to understand so your 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 dedication to the game because it took time hours, but it also helped. And of course we had a chess set. I mean. Nobody knew about computers at all. So and and uh, every book, you know, was something that you know you you treasured because most of these books, you know, we read, you know, from you know uh, top to bottom, from bottom to top. So this is just you know from first page to the last. Uh, it's um, uh, it, you know uh, it's it, it, it was a different world, but it actually probably gave us sort of a stronger um, um, impulse for 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 the future um, and. Uh, also, my coaches had, you know, influence on me, both Alexander Nikitin and in Baku, Alexander Shakarov, but of course, Botvinnik. They were all um, um, extra specialists in the opening. So they wanted to analyze. So this is, that's the analytical skills that I, I had my own passion, but with, you know, with so much influence around me, I concentrated more and more on just digging deeper and deeper in the openings. Though, when I just, you know, uh, looked at uh, my um, special um, notes for the World Championship match, as Judith mentioned, 84, 85. Something that we were so proud, you know, that's this, our great analysis. And now you put it on the computer, uh, <laughs> you, just, you don't want to see machines, <laughs> machines reactions screaming. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting because we thought in, in uh, late 70s, and early 80s, mid 80s, even late 80s, that we, we had something so precious, so powerful. It's like we believed that I had this, uh, as I had this you know, uh, uh, King's author sword, but actually it was a broken knife. <laughs> it, was just, it, was, it was so primitive. But this is something that, you know, that's the, uh, I would probably, you know, um, put uh, um, as another form of a law or just, you know, a formula. You know, if you do a lot of work and it's, it's, Later, you discover that this work not, was not probably, you know, the the of uh, the best quality. Still, somehow, magically, this work helps you to achieve results. Very often, I enter the game having an idea that later machine refuted, and it didn't happen on the board. But somehow, the hours and hours and hours of work that I I um, uh, um, invested in analyzing this position and this opening helped me to uh, win the game. Uh, that 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 went in different direction. No, I think I'd that's. Like uh, I think that's. Uh, go ahead. No, sorry. I just. Uh, it's it's uh, so nice to listen, Gary. How passionately he's describing his use and his. I'm sure you visualize it front of you. The stories you're talking <laughs> about. And uh, I, I always wonder, I mean, you have kids, I have kids, that how much are they engaged in what they are doing? Because I remember when I was engaged with daily, so much, everything was around chess. And uh, for the people who are not playing chess, they may only think that it's only move, species moving, and what's the difference between one or another, right? But for us, it was the nuances, the small details. It was really giving us great pleasure, right? But what was also interesting for me, what uh, you were describing when I was talking about my middle game and my creativity, and you were telling that your coaches were very much in the analytical attitude, and that's what you brought from already from a very young age, right? And I think yes. this is something very important to, to point out that it is so important where do we start, what is the starting point, who are our teachers, and what are the expectations, right? Because for me, for example, it was my father who loved all these tactical ideas and he was showing the evergreen game and later on your games, of course, and, and uh, those very spectacular ones. So that was the direction I was steering by my father. And also he was the, he had the aim to have teachers 
to guide me on that direction. And opening preparation was absolutely not important. I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed to say front of Gary that, but he knows it, that I was playing the King's Gambit opening, which is uh, softly saying it's not the best opening until almost I became a grandmaster level. So I was very much behind in opening thinking in theory compared to you, for example, because you had already this very structured, very systematic way of thinking, right? Of course, you had all the creativity, amazing uh, ideas, way of thinking, etc. But still, I think it is, it is so important already at a very young age what kind of teachers and guidance you get from your mentors or coaches. 